Today's conference is about the implications of the recent Pakistani election um, on the May the 11th. And we are looking at the internal implications of the policies that the new government will come in, what are the internal policies for the Pakistan, and what will be the implications for the foreign affairs policies around the region, um, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, and, and to the rest of the region as well. Uh, the relevance of this conference is quite evident, but if I may add to this, that it is the very first time that a uh, democratically elected government has passed on to another democratically elected government. And on top of it, with keeping the um, 2014 evacuation of the Afghanistan, the ISAF evacuation from the Afghanistan, that is also another event. That, and this government's policy will affect that as well. So it is all bringing it together, and it is making it that much more uh, um, interesting and relevant to us. A few points that I'll make in relation to this conference. This event is getting recorded, uh, and we will be putting a recorded version of it and an edited version of it later on on the two blogs, which is one is the Kings of War and the other is Strife blog. The other two uh, Department of War study blogs, the recordings will go on there. And the key interventions will be broadcasted as podcasts as well. Material will be transcribed and we will be making that available for the journalists and uh, they will be using it for their citations. The conference will be roughly for two hours and that will be divided into two sessions. The first session will be focused on the internal affairs of Pakistan. We'll have a short break after that. And the second session will be on the foreign affairs of Pakistan. The format is such that first, the Professor Anatol Levin will ask a question from the panel. The panel will give their answer, first individually, and then they will have a debate. And after that, we'll open the floors up for questions from this side. And to, in the second session, the question and answer session will be under Chatham House rules. For Pakistan, it will be in-camera session, so those uh, questions will not be attributed or we'll keep them off the record. Talat is a senior Pakistani journalist and a TV personality. He has a television talk show, Live with Talat, from Express News, and he writes for major newspapers in Pakistan and internationally. So I will now, without any further ado, turn it over to Talat. Talat, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Tarek. Uh, hi, everybody over there. Uh, let me quickly introduce the, in the interest of time, the panelists that we have. Uh, I believe you already have their, uh, their detailed uh, notes uh, in terms of introduction, so I would not waste time there. I've got Dr. Ishfaq Hassan Khan, uh, a noted economist, Mizdal retired Ali Baz Khan, somebody who comes from the defense uh, end of life in Pakistan, Air Marshal retired Shahzad Chaudhary, uh, of course, uh, services, but uh, writes very well and also is, is a former diplomat and Muhammad Ishfaq Khatak uh, who is tasked to uh, run a university in Fata. So that's the distinguished panels that we have over here. Uh, I think uh, we can ask uh, Professor Anatol Levin to uh, kick start the debate by shooting his first question. Go ahead. Thank you very much Talat. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you very well sir. <coughs> Good. Um, I'm sorry, just at the moment, I'm the panel at this end. Um, unfortunately, a, a couple of colleagues couldn't come. M um, Professor Theo Farrell will be joining us later uh, for the, um, the Chatham House section. Uh, well, my obvious question would be, uh, in the view of members of the panel, uh, what are the principal challenges facing the new government in terms of domestic <laughs> policy? And what do you think that they will be able to do about them? And if I could uh, ask a specific question, since we have uh, Mr. Khatak here, who is formerly uh, a distinguished official of Pakistan Railways, mm -hmm. uh, with particular reference to uh, state services and Pakistan Railways, uh, what has gone wrong with those over the years? And what can be done realistically to improve the situation? Uh, since with regard to railways uh, in particular, uh, this is an area that the new government has said that it will concentrate on. Thank you. Yes, uh, Khadek would you want to start first? Uh, work it backwards? Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I thought railways will come in the end, <laughs> but since uh, I, I feel uh, you think it's very important, thank you very much for that. Well, as far as public sector enterprises are concerned in Pakistan, there are more than 200, 225 something. 
big and small frankly they have not been doing very well during the last 10 years maybe 12 years the deficit during the last 5 years from 2007 to 2012 which the people of this country had to pay was about 16 billion rupees you can convert that into euros or or dollars and uh, when you look at the yearly deficit it's about 400 billion to 450 billion rupees a year by these state enterprises and let me tell you just eight of them threw up about 400 billion rupees of deficit last year now this is a very sad state of affairs in the sense that the people of this poor country the common citizen of this country is paying for the deficits and not getting the services a person sitting in uh, baltistan or koistan who has not seen energy who has not seen a train who has not seen a pia flight and who does not know what a utility store is he is paying for all these deficits and the unfortunate part is that the service is still not there most of this money has gone into payments of salaries and payments of pensions but the service has gone down so bad that when you talk of uh, most of these public sector enterprises you don't see the service there uh, you've talked of railway specifically i've been a railway man i am a railway man i consider myself a railway man once a railway man always a railway man uh, the deficit is about 40 billion this year and the people are going to pay for this trains are not there if trains are there they are ten, more than 10 to 12 hours late but let me tell you that this government which has come in and uh, tarik rightly said this is the first government which has come in through a democratic process uh, they've got a good mandate and i think they are very sincere and uh, dedicated people but i don't think that is enough to to bring these public sector enterprises back online i personally feel you need true professional people whether it is the railways or the uh, pia or the, the the energy sector to get these uh, enterprises back online so you need competent professional people whether you get them from france or from england or from nepal or any country but they need to be professional who understand those uh, the the dynamics of all those organizations if you don't need economists frankly you need people who understand those organizations who are good in management who are good in uh, economics uh, of those organizations now for the railways i think the government is very sincere but i wish the the, the minister for railways who is a very dedicated man the sincerity of purpose cannot be questioned but i wish he has the 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 political acumen of choosing the right people to run the railways and bring it back online and let me tell you it's very simple there's a huge policy disconnect uh, sorry a disconnect between the policy uh, formulation and implementation in the railways and in all these public sector enterprises there's a lot of political interference it is not be these organizations are not being run on political lines now when you talk of a rail uh, uh, train pakistan railways has been a public utility service for a long time yes the government has been paying for it they have been paying the subsidies they have been paying the deficits but now that it is no more a monopoly it is no more a utility service the government has very clearly said about 2 3 years back that it has to be a, a commercial organization where 2 plus 2 need to make 4 at least 5 if not 4 but when it makes 2 plus 2 is equal to 3 the government is very happy and we keep paying the subsidies and when you look at the 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 financial viability of train operations i think the it can be done it can easily be done provided the resources are channeled into financially viable areas and these areas are very simple you get the the resources into the freight sector and get the freight sector running the economy needs it the the growth rate if it has to be more than 4 5% per year needs it thank you very much thank Let you me bring in the dr ishfaq uh, and talk about the uh, challenges on the economic front yeah thank you talat <coughs> and good afternoon everybody there uh, your question was that what are the economic challenges that the newly elected government is facing the answer is there is there is no two opinion 
within the country and outside the country that Pakistan's economy was never been in such a bad shape as it is today. So I feel sorry <clears throat> for this uh, newly elected government. They inherited an economy which is really in bad shape. And that has compounded the challenges of the new government. Now, if I list, if I list the challenges, the first challenge is that the, our investment rate has been on the decline for the last uh, six, seven years now. And as a result of which, economic growth has slowed to an average of 3% per annum, slightly above the rate of population growth rate. In other words, the living standard of the people of Pakistan on average is either stagnant or it is improving at a very snail pace, which is uh, difficult to uh, uh, be observed uh, in real life. Now, since economy is growing at 3% rate, uh, rate per annum, it has lost its capacity to create jobs. Every year, approximately 2.5 million people are entering into the job market. To absorb all the new entrant, Pakistan's economy should grow in the range of 7 to 8 percent per annum. If it is growing by 3 percent per annum over a long period of time now, for, over the last five years, it means that not everybody who is entering the job market is getting a job, and therefore the pool of unemployed by definition is rising. There are several factors which have contributed to this uh, state of affairs. One is the mismanagement of power sector. I have not used the word shortage of energy or shortage of power. I have used the word mismanagement because Pakistan has no capacity constraint. <coughs> Pakistan has an installed capacity of over 22,000 megawatt, but currently it is producing somewhere in the range of 12 to 1300,000, 12 to 13,000 megawatt. Therefore, but it, there, there are potentials that it can, it can generate more and it is not being done because of a huge amount of circular debt which has uh, 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 which, which built up and uh, government is not in a position to pay back the difference between the cost of generation and the amount which is passed on to the consumer. So the gap has to be filled by Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Finance has little resources now available to give this much amount of money to, power, to uh, uh, the WAPDA and WAPDA to pay to the independent power producer and the independent power producer will have to pay to the uh, 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 oil refineries and oil refineries will have to pay to, uh, to uh, wherever they import oil from outside Pakistan. So the amount has now moved to uh, closer to around uh, you know, six to seven hundred billion now. And that has uh, affected the generation of uh, power uh, 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 sector. The other issues is large fiscal deficit. Uh, it is on, on average, it is 7% of GDP, which is twice as, as large as the average of the Asian developing countries. And since Pakistan sustained a very large fiscal deficit for quite a long time, it has accumulated public debt. It has more than doubled in the last five years. Our exports are stagnant. So we have a bleeding public sector enterprises, as uh, pointed out by uh, Mr. Khatak uh, at the very outset. And then we have a declining foreign exchange reserve because Pakistan is off the IMF program since May 2010 and therefore external inflows have dried up. Pakistan is continuously repaying its uh, external debt obligations and therefore the reserve is declining uh, continuously uh, and it is, uh, it is reaching to a level where Pakistan needs another IMF program. So I will stop here and I will you know, be deliberating if if you want to uh, have a more discussion on any one of these issues.
Let me now request Shahzad Chaudhary Sahib to dwell on the uh, question. Thank, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Talat, and good afternoon to everybody there um, in London. Uh, yeah, I, I think we could begin with uh, identifying the three or the uh, the list of challenges that this government has. Uh, they're monumental, of course, uh, all of them. But the short list would include uh, two that were mentioned by Dr. Ashfaq, which is, of course, the economy, the energy shortages. And perhaps one could add to that the ongoing war on terror uh, or the spate of terrorism that Pakistan has been in for about over a decade now. Uh, the ongoing war in Afghanistan, of course, becomes a part of that. I'm going to uh, take care of the, or, or look after, or discuss the war on terror aspect of it. Uh, what is this government, or the coming government that has been inducted in, uh, more passionate about? When it came in initially, I think it had, or it still has, great promise and potential uh, attached to it. There are a lot of hopes attached to this government's uh, tenure. Uh, but the last couple of weeks, which is too short a period to judge a government, actually, just because it isn't even 100 days, which is a honeymoon period, uh, but there should be, have been some signs in terms of indicating as to what this government plans to do about the war on terror. It declares the war on terror as uh, one of its very immediate or major concerns, but is not as passionate about it as perhaps it is about uh, economy or uh, uh, energy. Uh, I think it looks at the war on terror as a necessary evil to be dealt with and taken out of the way before it can actually begin to grapple with the economy and uh, the energy parts. So that's how I look at the government's current uh, sort of trend towards looking on war on terror. Um, what's happening on the war on terror? Of course, I mean, there is a possibility the government came in with, a, uh, with an inclination or with a cleared uh, stance of uh, uh, hoping to begin a dialogue uh, with the tariq e taliban in Pakistan, that is the the, 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 the uh, group of terrorists that actually is uh, taking the Pakistani state on. Uh, and uh, that should have perhaps been the first step. Now, it's quite possible that it might still eventuate and it might just begin with that. Uh, but there hasn't yet been a, a process that has actually begun to lead towards uh, in that direction. As I say this, it doesn't really mean that the war against terror has been halted or is it in a pause. Certainly not. Uh, the war goes on, as uh, those who keep track of uh, going on in Pakistan know very well, the Khyber Agency and the Orgzai uh, have a huge operation going on, as large as the uh, operation in Sawat, so that's what the army is doing. But of course there's a need for a parallel political plank. Political plank must augment what the military has been doing for the last five years. And therefore it must begin by first taking the ownership of what the politics must do, whether that begins with a dialogue, whether that begins with a set of conditions that we must lay before the uh, people who want to initiate some sort of a engagement with the Pakistani state and the Pakistani people. Uh, but that must begin and that hasn't yet begun. The number of meetings that the government in waiting, that this government when it was the government in waiting held on energy, on uh, economy, uh, unfortunately was not matched by perhaps the considerations or deliberations that were needed on uh, the security side of it. So that is what seems at this moment. Of course, there's a lot happening in Afghanistan in terms of a possibility of a dialogue and a peace effort there. Uh, should Pakistan uh, sort of latch on to that, not only enabling what is happening on, in Afghanistan, that has been enabled by Pakistan in a certain way along with other main players, but at the same time, perhaps look at the fact that is it also possible to begin a parallel uh, effort uh, within Pakistan to, to, to that effect and then perhaps determine and differentiate between the people, those who want to talk to the state, want to live within the constitution and those who do not and those who do not therefore become obviously a clear uh, set of people who need to be dealt with uh, by uh, other means and uh, that's uh, something that we need to do uh, I think the earliest and uh, one hopes that in the coming days that's what the government will sort of uh, uh, move on along. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask uh, General Ali Baz Khan to uh, take up the question of the challenges confronting this government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Talat, and uh, good afternoon at London. I, in fact, uh, I would like to divide the challenges being faced by Pakistan into three categories. First is the economic front, then is the social front, and third is the security front. As far as the economic front is concerned, the answers have been provided, I think, most comprehensively by my two colleagues. Now, there are certain security and uh, social challenges, in fact, Pakistan is facing, and which are not, in fact, being talked about regularly on the TV sh shows or during the or in the newspapers. Let's take, in fact, the first, the national attitude. 
the people the citizens are becoming radicals they are losing tolerance and i fear that if the state of things is not taken care of it might lead to the loss of national pride and national morale which is the most dangerous thing for a nation now let let's look at certain things we used to hold 23rd march parade which was a symbol of national pride because of the radicalism and terrorism in fact with the nation has started forgetting about that we used to hold horse and cattle show in lahore which was a very big cultural and social event for from pakistan it is no more being held because of the many reasons like this security challenge others and there used to be very in fact prominent open melas and fanfare in fact which used to be held across the country it's no more there and latest the shandur mela which was a very regular feature in the upper uh, reaches of pakistan it has been postponed very recently so these are some of the social challenges that pakistan is facing and we need to address in fact and the social the, the main cause why we are losing the confidence in our own self is because of the terrorism the radicalism now as far as terrorism is concerned the answer has been provided by air marshal uh, shahzad you see as far as pakistan is concerned it's not our creation you look at the prior to 911 pakistan was a very very in fact tolerant country and people were uh, in fact that used to take pride in uh, their national symbols but after 911 and what is happening in afghanistan and we came the first line state to help the international community and the dividends we are getting from the international world is the negative media and there is no in fact material support coming from uh, outside despite the promises so that the kind of in fact uh, feeling which is breeding in pakistan and the lastly is the security challenges pakistan in the past used to face only one front threat scenario then we came down to two front threat scenario that is on the western side and eastern side now we are facing three front threat scenario that is internal and the internal is the most dangerous in fact we don't know where the people are hiding from where they can strike they are living just like my neighbors i don't know who is my neighbor whether he is a he is a he is a pro, is a pro pakistani patriot or pakistani non patriot pakistani so that is the kind of situation pakistan is going through and for that pakistan alone cannot address these issues the international community must i would say again must stand with pakistan to to address all these issues which are being faced today thank you very much thank you thank you uh, i guess the next uh, aspect is for me to uh, conduct a bit of a debate around the questions uh, that have been raised and the answers that have been given that that's correct uh, anatol levin uh, uh, yes, is I that our understanding e yes that's it yes okay let me uh, let me uh, say this that uh, not that i am in denial or anything but it's uh, so overwhelmingly negative that i am wondering uh, what happened on 11th of may then i mean why were we so why the nation was uh, in a state of um, bliss in a manner of speaking uh, why did we talk about uh, you know country turning around uh, turning the corner um, and the hopefulness uh, so i would want to ask uh, one by one my panelists if they could dwell on this I mean, this being the state of affairs it sounds pretty hopeless if that's an exaggeration then you know tell us how can the government turn it around what are the silver linings if we could see any one of them at all for example let's start with you sir i i look at it in a different way i think <coughs> this uh, change over from one political government to another was a blessing for this country let me tell you the democratic values that are ingrained in the people of this country i think we tend to miss that this democratic value which is there in the common man has forced dictators to become leaders here after every 2 years the dictator who comes in 
he wants to become a leader he starts addressing people and then he brings in political changes he brings in the assembly whether it is a, a non elected uh, a non party base or whatever or bd system you you look at history i think it is the people of this country who, who ha- has forced the dictators the military uh, uh, people to go in for elections after some time so that aspect and that asset i think this country has and i have full faith in that value and it will keep i i hope it is always there and i think as long as this process of democracy goes on and i wish it goes on for another uh, maybe uh, 20 centuries but that is one way that this country can get out of this rut when you have a democratic system it encourages all kinds of developments whether it is economic or social i think the base <laughs> the democratic base needs to be there and i'm proud that uh, the people of this country and the politicians of this country uh, are there this government has changed and i think with a very sincere sincerity of purpose and very sincere effort i think we are going to get through we have been through the worst of times i think during uh, the last 10 years so i think we can't go back uh, uh, rock bottom than this and i think we are going to improve marginally every year marginally every year uh, now um, dr ishfaq you had words of sympathy for this government yes. uh, people were hoping that you would uh, tell us how this government is going to actually deliver is it capable of delivering the goods uh, changing the trajectory and you know creating some silver linings or no yes i i have a uh, uh, lot of faith on the the list of ministers uh, are being appointed by the new government they are more experienced more educated they have uh, they know the issues i am particularly referring to the finance minister uh, and the recent budget although the, the government uh, uh, had only about a week time uh, to prepare or finalize the budget and present that budget Uh, naturally there are many issues that uh, uh, left uh, unanswered but this is the first budget and one cannot hope uh, that in one budget all the issues which i have described earlier can be resolved but i think attempt has been made uh, a significant attempt has been made uh, to address all those economic challenges which i have listed for example the budget suggests that uh, fiscal deficit will be reduced by 2 and 1/2 percent of percentage point of gdp i think this is a major adjustment uh, which will be taking place uh, the second thing is the government is seriously addressing the issues of circular debt because it is constraining pakistan's economic growth to the extent of 2 and 1/2 to 3 percent per annum so this is a frontal attack on circular debt and the government is very serious on these issues and there are budgetary measures which has been taken the government has also uh and large the size of the development is spending and it has identified its priorities which is building and strengthening the infrastructure it is also broadening the tax basis although there are much to be desired but efforts have been made expenditure rationalization the government has reduced the, uh, their expenditure as well so these are some of the initiative which has been taken place uh, let me also point out that if you look at uh, our 65 years of history Pakistan has seen many ups and downs and the uh, the, the state of, uh, of affairs at which we are in is not new to Pakistan we have faced this type of uh, challenges many times before and then we have the capacity to bounce back and i'm pretty sure that uh, in the medium term uh, lots of economic challenges which i have listed here will be addressed uh, if i could just quickly ask you uh, as a follow up uh, what are the things that we as pakistanis and international community which is which would want pakistan uh, to to do well uh, in terms of uh, investments in pakistan should be looking at in the next couple of months to know that the trajectory has changed yes i think uh, uh, people uh, i am particularly aware of the fact that people within the country and outside the country have lined up for uh, entering into pakistan for investment purpose they were just waiting for this budget to be presented and some policy guidelines to be streamlined uh, there are areas like power sector for example 
there is enormous uh, opportunities to invest here and make money then the sky is the limit because pakistan has a growing middle class with buying power uh, and these are the people who will be spending money so anything which can be uh, which can uh, any investor which can come here and spend money uh, they will be rewarded for that pakistan is seen many sh big shopping malls which have come up even in a country, uh, city like islamabad where you can see uh, uh, hundreds of pakistanis uh, uh, spending time there spending money buying goods so we have a capacity to spend money we have a growing middle class with lots of buying power so i think if there is a change of government this is a pro business government the stock market has reacted pakistani private sector has reacted they are very upbeat and i'm i, I also know that the foreign investors are also very upbeat so it is a matter of time okay but uh, all of this is happening uh, if i could bring in my other two colleagues here uh, in the context of a pretty precarious security situation uh, post 11th of may uh, elections you got very bad news coming out of pakistan so if you were to look at international press uh, to which general uh, ali baz khan um, referred as well and yourself as well negative press uh, you would have the uh, founder of pakistan's residency getting torched uh you would have bomb blasts uh you know paralyzing your main cities uh and then latest and a, and a very sad event of uh, tourists uh, getting shot um, in an area which frankly uh, is somewhat inaccessible uh, so the international community is looking at pakistan from the point of view of security uh what what sort of headway have we made uh, and can this government make uh, in in handling this situation Yeah, thank you, Talat. Uh, you know, uh, Pakistanis are uh, tend to be highly cynical, uh, and we seem to have absorbed this uh, trait over the last some decades. Uh, but despite such cynicism, I mean, I go back to, for example, the election. The point that you made first, and I'll be very, very brief to talk about it. I mean, the hope that got generated and the participation that was there in the elections was the silver lining that the Pakistani people and the Pakistani nation could look. up to and and not that it is over and done with no i don't think so uh, um, you you mentioned the uh, case of uh, the security challenges undoubtedly you know it was there was a need for uh, perhaps people like me expected that this government will hit the deck running uh, i it may not have happened but we like we said earlier it's just about two weeks that this government has been in place what needs to be seen is that there is obviously an effort by the taliban Taliban that have taken on the state of Pakistan to force an agenda. They've held back for about couple of couple of weeks also. Uh, they've been waiting for the Pakistani state to uh, come in and the Pakistani government, the new Pakistani government, to actually begin to show what do they have in terms of an offer for the Taliban. And since for the last two weeks the government has been rather quiet on those elements and those concrete type of issues. it seems to me that the it's given the space or we've let that space be used by the taliban to force their agenda now on the government so so uh, implicitly the pakistani state has fallen on to another reaction reactionary uh, position so rather than be leading the this particular pursuit in terms of either war or peace or both or whatever strategy was to be put into place i haven't seen that happening and that is why this uh, the this giving away of space and therefore the lagging and holding giving out the initiative to the other side has tended to give that space to the taliban to do what they've done starting from gilgit down to karachi and that's a concern to me and that is why i hope that uh, somebody in the government and some I, i think it's got to be the prime minister's office uh, or somebody else must begin uh, a, a very uh, apparent and a clear Uh, effort to try and develop some sort of a counter terrorism policy some sort of a national security policy the two policies that we've not been having for the last so many years now i mean we should have actually begun with those things and therefore those are two voids that continue to afflict pakistan's effort and therefore we stay on to one track which is just outsourcing it to the military letting the military do the fighting but uh, rarely ever moving on other avenues which includes the politics as well as the economics to try and resolve that issue so that's what i feel has been the cause of concern and uh, like i said but let's hope that within the coming but at the same time if i if i could just add here, again a brief follow up uh, karachi presents a different kind of a uh, terrorist proposition altogether uh, as as a challenge um of course there are sort of underlying currents of uh, al qaeda and tariq e taliban pakistan operating there but the political violence uh, the the bloodletting has a definitive uh, political angle to it and that itself is a big challenge for the present government how do you think 
uh, they should be fearing on that count yeah you know when we look at uh, terrorism as a, as a threat to pakistan society or the state uh, we tend to look at it a more monolithic sort of a treatment uh, but to treat it or to deal with it we've got to actually deconstruct it into the various parts and therefore we have three different parts in terms of looking at terrorism in pakistan or extremism or militancy or uh, whatever else goes along in terms of what's happening in karachi what happens in balochistan and what is happening in fata now each of these may give similar symptoms but the underlying uh, disease or the malaise is entirely different so in karachi if you have a militancy or the militants related or militant wings of the political parties it's got to be a much more political effort there in terms of coordinating in terms of co-opting people and trying to find a political resolution and giving up those kind of militant and of course there will be some elements which are criminal some elements which are extremists and those need to be dealt with by the law in in the right way but you must first take out the that particular dry out the pond that has been created by the militant wings of those parties in balochistan it's much more of a political thing and i think the politics must take the lead there if you do not do that then you leave it to the military and the military knows only one way third thing you come to the uh, fata or the terrorism that takes place within the fata regions much more of counter insurgency in, uh, inclusive of many terrorism acts so therefore you have the army doing the things there but along with that you will need your political and economic plans to function in the parallel so that's what i feel we need to how how we need to proceed on general ali bas khan this sets the stage beautifully for the uh, you know fundamental issue about pakistan um that is decision making uh, may 11 uh, first time a civilian government handed over power to another civilian government first time ever you had an interim government which is based on consensus an election commission which in spite of all its faults was again uh, a consensus based election and by and large everybody has agreed that this is as far uh, as pakistan can can throw up uh, a fair election now uh, what is it tell you about the nature of uh, relationship between the military and the uh, present day government because it all boils down to uh, whether the two wings of the state and the government are together focused on these issues or not do you think things are changing over there or is it sort of same old game being played i think the old game is over it was over in fact uh, right from the day the ppp government came in in fact there is a, there's there was a, there's very big change in the attitude of the military in fact and uh, you have seen it and everybody has seen it how they have supported the political process and the political government but before i delve on this question in fact just two points in fact i just like to add what uh, dr ashwath has said said on the economy two issues one in fact the government has to in fact uh, take initiative to inculcate the culture of tax paying in this country you see what has happened they increased just 1% gst and there was a human cry in the whole country so the culture has to be brought in where people they readily accept that the tax paying is the demand of the nation not demand of the government because we require it and secondly there is a huge informal economy operating in pakistan Mayors may be taken by this government. I don't know whether they are taking taking or not. Doctor Ashwag Hasan Khan will uh, maybe he can uh, say something on that. But that economy has to be brought into into the mainstream. And let me say that when there is a problem in the economy, in fact, the Pakistan will, will feel that the our FDIs are going down and our foreign exchange is dwindling. It is the informal economy, in fact, which is helping Pakistan. So these two issues they need to be in fact looked into by the. present government now on the issue of the civil military relations which uh, have been uh, asked by mr talat as far as the, the military is concerned it is always acts in the advisory role of the civil government we take the example of pentagon i have been visiting pentagon a number of times when i was in service and the process i have seen there see on the day 9 11 took place the opinion of pentagon dominated the opinion of the state office why is it so because when america says we are in a state of war pakistan is also perpetually in a state of war since then so america being in a state of war so there has to be a military opinion to guide them to tell them how to unfold their security policies so that the role of the pentagon has been playing and pakistan also has been playing this role during the past civil government 
the present leadership I know, they are determined to help the political process and the way the elections have taken place fair and free, there was absolutely no role of the military in that. They stayed away as per the direction of the election commission, they only provided the security. So that is the level of confidence that the military has created amongst the nation. So both instruments, the political and the military, political instrument is supreme and the military instrument is subservient, but their advice on the geostrategic issues and the security issues has to be taken because no government of the world can wish away their opinion because they have calculated the opinion on the geostrategy which helps in fact to, to it, it becomes an instrument for the geopolitics of the political instrument. If, if I could just intervene here because we, I'm exhausting my 15 minutes, I think I've gone over by about two minutes. But I think the question becomes uh, relevant uh, and more poignant in, in case of Pakistan um, because the you know, Pentagon has no history of throwing an elected president out of the office. Um, and you know, within the parameter of the decision making, you do have different types of opinions coexist. Of course, one opinion dominates the other depending on the nature of the issue at hand. I think right now the question is being asked in the, cons uh, in, the, in, the, in, the in the context of whether the civilians will have the final say in terms of which way the, this country is going to go or not. You think that issue has also been settled? Surely that has been settled in fact in my view. And uh, you see you can't uh, now play the blame game here and there. And you have seen it in fact during the past PPP government for the past five years. How in fact the military has been helping the civil government despite many follies here and there. But they have been helping them, they have assisting them so that the political process takes roots in this country. Okay. Uh, back to you, Professor Levin. Thank you so much. Uh, so I will now open the floor to questions from this end. So my name's Fred Carver, and I'm a PhD candidate here at King's. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the last elections, which uh, maybe the results weren't a huge surprise, but uh, the scale particularly of the Muslim League's victory in the Punjab, and yet its failure to win more than a handful of seats outside the Punjab, uh, maybe was quite surprising. Um, I think it's pretty obvious what the risks are of having um, Pakistan's largest province vote one way and then the rest of Pakistan largely vote for different parties. But I just want to know, in the panel's opinion, sort of how aware is the government government of these risks and what attempts do you think they'll be making to introduce uh, greater federalism and or just be more aware of these stresses that are created by the other provinces not having so much of a stake in the central state. Uh, and specifically also with regards to Karachi, uh, which you know Pakistan's largest city already to a certain extent and should be to a greater extent the kind of economic domino of Pakistan having really a almost completely different politics to the rest of Pakistan and, and to a large extent you know different political parties different ways of winning elections what do you think the impact of that is? Well one factor that I think we must consider is uh, uh, a growing trend of regionalism um, perhaps in South Asia if not the world and, and certainly if not the Asia uh, but what you see in India, in our neighborhood, is exactly the same trend. Uh, you will see a, a party in the center, and you will see uh, different parties that are actually heading various states, and they have about 26 of them, uh, if not more. Now, uh, perhaps for Pakistan, this is the second time uh, in, in succession that we've had some these kind of election results. Uh, these are a bit... Uh, strange from the Pakistani historical perspective simply because of the fact that the Pakistani parties or the Pakistani election results have tended to either been uh, controlled in a certain way, uh, alleged to have been controlled in a certain way or simply uh, they've been swept by uh, a particular individual and I refer back to how Mr. Zulfiqar Bhutto swept the election in 1970. Having said that, uh, Punjab has about 148 uh, seats for, on which direct elections will t normally take place and that is far more than uh, you know the, the, the other provinces uh, and th there's no doubt that anyone uh, wishing to carry the elections in Pakistan will obviously will have to make a reasonably good progress uh, in, in Punjab 
uh, along with the other three uh, provinces. So that's the reality that of the new politics uh, that is emerging in Pakistan. Uh, I think let's give it an opportunity. Let's give it a chance. Uh, let's also give a, give sort of a fair uh, uh, you know chance to the fact that uh, the Pakistanis may have also matured uh, democratically and politically, and and we're pretty uh, happy to have different uh, parties heading uh, other provinces, uh, as indeed Punjab headed by a party that is Rep Punjab. Um, so I think that's how the the political spectrum looks at the moment. Uh, nothing to be worried about. I think this particular government in the center has played a very, very mature hand in letting other parties sort of rule if they were in majority in those provinces. And I think that this is going to be a very useful uh, uh, sort of addition or, 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 or a gain for the federation rather than weakening the federation in any, any shape and form. I tend to agree in fact what Avyam Shahzad has said. You see, it is too early to form an opinion of a government which is just unfolding. They are just, in fact, uh, looking at the issues. They are still, in fact, trying to formulate their policies. And as already been said, that Punjab, although it's a dominant province and there is the majority of seats, but look at the, in fact, the political wisdom of the central government. In Baluchistan, the National Party has been given the, in fact, the, 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 the what to say, the, the chief minister is from the National Party and the president is from another uh, party which is again a regional party. Likewise, Tariq PTI in, in, in our uh, Skhaver Pakhtunka province, they have been given the, the mandate, the, the, in fact they have been allowed to form the government, although the, there were some, some in fact, uh, pushes and pulls, which in fact uh, they, they, they have been evaded by Nawaz Sharif, the, the Prime Minister. And then same, Again, the People's Party, it is their mandate, so they are uh, trying to rule. But I think uh, political sense and some common sense will prevail among the political leaders. And let's see, in fact, uh, we, we, are, we are hopeful that the, this inter-provincial harmony will take place, inshallah, after some time. We need to give them some time. I think there was another co uh, minor question was from Karachi. Karachi has been in a disturbed situation for uh, uh, quite some time. And uh, it is a major contributor to our tax revenue. So since Karachi has remained in a disturbed situation for quite some time, it has affected Pakistan fiscal situation. And when I had stated earlier in my opening statement, I said uh, Pakistan sustained a very large budget deficit, over 7% of GDP. One of the reasons was the, uh, the decline in uh, tax collection uh, because of the disturbed situation in Karachi. I think the present government is fully aware of this, uh, this challenge and I'm sure will be addressing the Karachi situation seriously because Pakistan's economic prosperity <coughs> depends on peace and stability in Karachi. Karak sir, you want to add something? A very short comment. Uh, as I said earlier, the democratic process in this country is in the incubation stage, very early stage. It will take a lot of time. But I don't see anything wrong, politically wrong, with the results of the, uh, the uh, recent elections. When you look at electoral uh, uh, results, elective politics is different from, from field politics. When you look at the three parties, I think they are represented in all the three provinces. When you look at the votes, there is a minor difference between the two sec uh, second and the third party. So I think the parties are there. And politically, I, I, I don't see anything wrong. Uh, the uh, very political questions, none of us is a politician here. Uh, your second question about law and order, I think that was answered uh, by my friend. Okay, let me, uh, with your permission, uh, I'm not a politician, but I'm a journalist who, who covers these issues. Let me uh, try to uh, give you my two bits of analysis on this. Uh, why did the election result come as a bit of a surprise to the expat community in of course, the international community was because of the mythology of tsunami built by Pakistan Tariq and Saf. I think most of us in the media, uh, as well as the expat community, uh, were taken in by the um, rhetoric, which was sizzling, which was very fresh, which was very new, and the response that Imran Khan got. And everybody uh, was swept away uh, by the anticipation uh, and expectation, which turned out to be uh, somewhat unrealistic that Imran Khan is going to sweep. Now, if 
Imran Khan's uh, forecasts about his electoral prospects uh, were to come true, it would have really been flying in the face of the entire subcontinental electoral history. You do not find uh, this kind of uh, a result um, in, in the entire electoral history of the subcontinent which was being anticipated. So one, the expectation level was very high. The other, I think in Punjab, what nobody uh, anticipated, um, which was again an omission uh, or oversight of analysis, was the complete rout of Pakistan People's Party uh, and Pakistan Muslim League uh, Q. Sorry, I'm going very native on this, but it's important to make this point. Sure. Uh, so when, when these two parties were routed, these, these parties represent traditional voters. While Imran Khan did appeal to and got massive, uh, uh, you know, uh, vote of confidence from the new voter. The traditional voter, uh, having left the old party platforms like People's Party and Pakistan Muslim League Q, kind of queued up and started to vote for Pakistan Muslim League Noon. So that partly explains the phenomenal uh, uh, increase in the vote bank of Pakistan Muslim League Noon in, in, in Punjab. And mo last point on this is that, well, you know, Punjab is a very diverse kind of province. Yes, block votes suggest that it's one province, but it is not. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, you know half of this province is is south of uh, Punjab, which uh, claims itself to be uh, qualified to become a separate province altogether. That is the Saiki province. So if you see it from that angle, uh, Pakistan Muslim League Noon's performance in potentially a new province in Punjab itself has been remarkable. So you know they got a lot of votes from the south as well. Uh, Muslim League Noon is the uh, second largest party uh, in in Balochistan, and they've got their own. Uh, they supported chief minister over there and they are the third largest party in KPK uh, as well. So you know the, this tendency to see parties in regional terms uh, I think is is uh, is not correct. And let me just qualify it by saying that I am a critic of Pakistan Muslim League Noon, um, especially after they appointed uh, a little nobody to head Pakistan's cricket. Uh, and I take my cricket like all uh, honorable people should. Uh, very seriously, so I am not exactly fond of the way they have gone about fixing Pakistan's cricket. But you know, facts be told, I think uh, this this verdict uh, uh, has come as a surprise to us because, frankly, we missed the writing on the wall in more ways than one. Can I, can I just add? To yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I I did not comment on it earlier in my earlier response to the question, but I think underlying somewhere in that question is a possibility or an effort to investigate the possibility that will Punjab be cut down to size. Uh, to, to strengthen the federation. Now, I personally, and I'm sure many people in Pakistan, uh, would like an administrative restructuring of the Pakistani state. Uh, but it must be administrative. It cannot be restricted to only one province. It will have to be done on the basis of all four provinces. And we can cut the uh, provinces or increase the provinces, in fact, uh, to, to uh, cut the current provinces into more administrative provinces and therefore create a sense of uh, much greater participation and also taking the uh, uh, delegate delegate responsibility as well as the power down to the uh, to the people in the remote areas. I think that's a step that the Pakistani state will have to take certain time in the future. As, as stated earlier, it's too early for Pakistan while just about settling with democracy to try and tinker around with many more things which are structural in nature. So, but I think that might just might come when we have a little more assured uh, democracy in place. Uh, maybe uh, a couple of more election turns down the line. Thank you. Um, if I may ask a, a question, uh, one that's been raised before, but in a more pointed form, should the new government negotiate uh, with the Pakistani Taliban and their allies, uh, or should it not? Uh, if it is to negotiate, what realistically, or indeed ethically, can it actually offer to the, um, the Pakistani militants uh, in, in an effort to, to seek peace? And what should it categorically not offer to them um, to, to prevent uh, a return to the situation which prevailed uh, in the past, uh, where, where peace deals led to the militants taking over more and more territory in certain areas. I, that's for anyone in the panel who wishes to answer, but uh, of course uh, our military colleagues might have a particular view on this. Thank you. That's you want to start or all right. Okay. Okay. I'll take this. Yeah. Uh, my my take on this particular aspect of uh, whether talking to the Taliban or not talking to, to the Taliban is very simple. Uh, I don't think the state 
the state per se should needs to be wary of anything a state is more powerful state has all the resources in its hand a state can dialogue a state can fight and state can fight and talk uh, and it has the uh, yeah you got to be more sensible about the timing of the whole thing uh, but it can intervene at any moment in any particular situation and and choose one of the options the uh, from the entire list that i mentioned uh, having said that i feel the taliban the pakistani taliban are also in some sort of a tight corner at this moment as they see a possibility of the afghan taliban along with whom they had created a sort of a larger nexus in which they existed uh, perhaps you know uh, reaching the point where there's a possibility that they might actually go back to afghanistan from the pakistani fata territories and if when that happens that ne nexus obviously gets broken uh, with the nexus being broken there is a certain amount of denudation of uh, support and money and of course uh, the inherent strength that each gains from the other Uh, now that in my judgment actually weakens the pakistani taliban so rather than the pakistani state offering uh, anything to the taliban i have uh, i have a feeling that it's a, it's a situation of the taliban uh, making an offer to the pakistani state and if the pakistani state doesn't like it it must just simply uh, throw it away the other three things i think or a couple of things that the the pakistani state will obviously make it very clear to the people anyone that wants to engage in a in a dialogue or a discussion is one that the pakistani constitution is supreme that they will have to recognize and accept the state as well as the constitution of pakistan and any changes that they wish or perceived to be made into the pakistani society or the system of government or whatever else will have to come through the parliament of pakistan and the parliament of pakistan the the laws of pakistan and the and the constitution of pakistan is supreme and that is the rubric under which i think any dialogue or discussion will take place outside of it i don't think any dialogue will take place it's a very Although it's not a simple, straight question, it's a very complex question, in fact. But let me start with a military dictum, which says that all wars fight their way to achieve ceasefire. And another uh, military saying, in fact, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, one of the captains of war that Little Heart said, that strategy looks at the business of fighting. grand strategy looks much beyond that is the establishment of peace so it dictates to say two things as for the military is concerned they 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 the way they are ordered they have to their their business is fighting but the political instrument which plays with the grand strategy their problem is to achieve ultimate peace now to achieve ultimate peace there have to be a negotiating table you have to talk to the people all the in fact issues all the conflict all the wars have ended with a written agreement but to negotiate with someone it has to be from the position of strength as air marshal shahzad has said that there is a constitution if you want to negotiate with them constitution of pakistan has to be accepted by them then the arms have to be in fact uh, shed away from them the business of fighting has to be stopped supreme court of pakistan has to be accepted an institution so the statehood has to be accepted by the warring party party of the dalit taliban or whoever it is so that is the condition on which the the political government can negotiate and that might be a time when they have to negotiate thank you Imam Sajid from National Association of British Pakistanis. What do the panel think that the Pakistani people, in their wisdom, have given absolute majority to Nawaz Sharif Muslim League in the centre and also in few other places, few places? But apparently, all three parties have their own say in their different provinces. For example, People's Party is only in Sindh province. and it is it ethnically divided pakistan or there is going to be inclusivity in terms of uh, pakistani people coming out of this difficult time economically and also uh, on other fronts which have been mentioned earlier and second issue is that uh, somehow due to election processing musharraf league all muslim 
league were not given chance to uh, compete in the elections and now today the news is he is going to face a big high treason case as well. What the panel think about these implications of elections? Reverend Rana Yuab Khan, Forum for International Relations and Development. My question is about the challenges that the state of Pakistan is facing for its uh, ch challenges to its um, uh, religious diversity. Religious minorities in Pakistan face a lot of challenges that comes from social, constitutional, and uh, so many arenas. Uh, what the present government is um, thinking to deal the challenges that religious minorities are facing and also um, when a few of um, uh, the panelists talked about uh, uh, the education uh, uh, education as one of the priorities of this government uh, there is a quite deep concern from again from religious minority side that there is a, um, uh, there is a quite potential in uh, in the curriculum of uh, pakistan that hate material is being produced uh, through this uh, book of syllabus uh, please respond to this question. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I have a very quick question regarding the, uh, one of the panelists raised the point, a very pertinent point about social problems in Pakistan and the problem of uh, rising radicalization of the population. And I, I'm interested to know what you would think um, is the cause of this, because like you said, it's not uh, very focused on is often collapsed with the problem of militancy and I'd like to specifically disentangle it from that and see what could be causing this issue. Yeah, my question is related to an earlier question about minorities um, but with specific focus on uh, the resurgence of violence against Shias that we're currently seeing in Pakistan and almost a mainstreaming of hatred uh, which in the beginning was very much restricted to certain groups like the SSP, but now we see it within society. So um, my su uh, question is, what would you suggest ways of combating the issue? And just a slight, if you could comment on the future of Sunni Shia relations within the country, do you think things would get worse or how to basically combat the issue? Thank you very much. Regionalization. Let me respond to the first question regarding ethnic parties. And, and parties are getting a mandate in different provinces, different parties. Let me tell you, these are political parties. They've been there for a long time. These are not ethnically based or sectarian based. These are true to political parties. Somehow, as I said earlier, democracy has not been given a chance in this country. They may not be uh, uh, real political parties where you have uh, 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 all the ingredients of a political party, but they're not ethnically based. So your question, in, in a, see, in Sindh, we have the Pakistan People's Party, which is the national, nationally based party. In, in uh, Khyber Pakhtunpa, we have the PTI, which again has, has uh, uh, run for the national elections, and there is no ethnicity in, in the PTI. And again, the Pakistan Muslim League N is a national political party. So I think the, the uh, perception of uh, ethnic based parties in Pakistan is uh, not true. If there are there, yes, there are some parties which have been completely routed in this election. Again, it shows the, the, the acumen of the general public of this country, and as I said, I, I paid compliments to the democratic values that the people have. Okay. Yeah, uh, let me try and uh, handle the most uh, complex of these, which is the Sunni Shia uh, problem in Pakistan, and it actually is a major problem uh, for all of us, and uh, quite an embarrassing and a shameful one. Uh, of course, there's a history to this, and I'm not going to go into it, but just going back to 1979, when the, the, um, the state of Pakistan got involved with uh, CIA and the rest of the people in terms of throwing the Soviets out of Afghanistan when they first entered there in 1979, I think we let a lot of money as well as influence come out of uh, the Middle East in terms of Wahhabi or oblique Salafi uh, um, influences into, into our uh, mainstream Islam. Uh, and that has somehow uh, gotten uh, entrenched in, in certain areas. There's been a lot of money and the money continues to come in. Unfortunately, that part of uh, uh, the effort that the Pakistani state should have perhaps been more conscious of uh, has missed the uh, focus from the Pakistani perspective and that is why we find while the monies keep coming in, the influence survives, the influence thrive, uh, thrives and that is what is creating uh, a much more uh, emphatic uh, Wahhabi Salafi uh, strain of Islam. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the more moderate, 
Sufi strain of Islam that the Pakistanis have known to have and still in the majority uh, uh, possess, as a, possess as their preferred choice. And, and that has created the divisions uh, that earlier were not there between the Sunni and the, Sunni and the Shia. Uh, how, to, how, to get, uh, how to sort of get out of this situation? Uh, I think, of course, education is one. Uh, we need to continue to emphasize the importance of uh, the more moderate strains of Islam. Uh, I don't want to call it Sufi Islam, but the Islam that is generally practiced by the Pakistanis has been a very moderate kind of an Islam. Uh, there's obviously the war on terror aspect of it, which is obviously giving them the space that they can enforce what they wish to enforce on Pakistan. And that's an area that we need to fight very, very hard. And fourth and final, we need to... Uh, make sure that the monies that come in and sort of become a source of proxy wars in Pakistan must be taken care of. And I'm not talking only of the Saudi or the Qatari or the um, Emirati uh, influence in Pakistan. I also talk of the Iranian influence in terms of their groups that they sort of sustain uh, in, in this particular effort. So I think there's a, there's a great amount of work ahead for Pakistan to make sure that we can cut off these resources or sources of funding. And if we do that and perhaps tackle more effectively on the law and order side, we may be able to uh, tackle this hopefully. And we should be able to tackle this. It's not that we have not known how to live amicably together. Yeah. <clears throat> I think if, uh, one of the questions was that uh, how or why uh, PMLN uh, got absolute majority. Uh, was this intentional from the uh, voters' point of view? I think uh, Pakistan, if you look at experience of Pakistan with coalition government in the center, it has not been up to the mark. Uh, we have not learned uh, to govern a state in coalition with other uh, smaller parties. Therefore, given the amount of multi-dimensional challenges that the Pakistan is facing today, I think the voters decided to give them a majority uh, to PML, an absolute majority, so that they should not be dependent on other smaller parties so that they can exploit the situation uh, to their benefit. So I think this was perhaps uh, in the mind of the uh, voters uh, that give them a fair amount of chance uh, so that they are not dependent on smaller parties to run the state of affairs. The question of uh, minorities, my colleague has already provided the answer for that. But let me tell you, you cannot isolate the minorities from the mainstream other Pakistani nationalities because they are part of the same society as far as the radicalism and terrorism is concerned. I take terrorism the branches of the same tree, whether they are being perpetrated in Karachi or in Pakistan or in Khyber Pakhtunkha or maybe some places in Punjab also. So it's very difficult to differentiate who is against the minorities who is against the security forces and who is against the common man? So whatever target they find, they will try to gun down. You see, one of the governors of Pakistan was assassinated. It was, he was not from the minority. And so many others have been gunned down who are not from the minority. So this is a very complex issue. Actually, we have to deal with this issue of uh, terrorism and militancy very, very comprehensively. Let's not divide at the moment that the minorities are suffering, or Shias are suffering, Sunnis are not suffering, or so and so are suffering. I think uh, we have to comprehensively look at the problem at the national level. So that is uh, on the minorities. Can I take on the, in fact, the issue of the social problems? Ji, go ahead. Ra radicalization. Okay. Social issues radicalization, so many other things, losing patience. You see, Pakistani society was not like that. You have to go back to the era of 60s and mid 70s and look at Pakistan, what kind of Pakistan it was. It was a very vibrant, very tolerant, very patient society. But then there were some geopolitical and geostrategic games which were unfolded in this area and the region. The Soviets came in and then the era of Zawal Haq. We in that time, in fact, in the 80s, we became the frontline state. 
and are fighting against Russian forces, of course, in collaboration with the with other friends like USA and uh, some international countries. But the effect of that era was the gun culture came in Pakistan, the drug culture came in Pakistan, the bullets they became and were very common. And Karachi, I know in, during that period, even if you, if you would hold a toy pistol, people would say, please put it down because it's a very dangerous thing. And today you, you see what kind of society it has become. So it's not our own doing. In fact, uh, unfortunately, it is maybe some part of our, our doing also, but this is the, the overall impact and the influence of the, the geopolitical scenario which has been uh, unfolding in this region. So right from the 70s till today, our nation is passing through this malaise. And because of that, there is unemployment, there is a poverty, there is illiteracy. We have not been able to address these issues because there have been the times of just the stability for coming for two years, two and a half years, and then again we are in the same imbroglio. So these are some of the issues in fact which have led Pakistan to the way we stand. Thank you. Okay, I think I'll just, uh, as a wind up note on the minorities uh, issues uh, and radicalization, let me uh, beg to differ with uh, General Saab, that's one point of view, but I think Pakistan's system uh, does have huge legal political uh, weaknesses uh, and the minorities uh, feel particularly vulnerable uh, operating in the system. Uh, they are seen as soft targets uh, by you know, social thugs uh, to uh, religious fundamentalists, uh, to people who uh, take away their lands and their women uh, and basically justice does nothing for them. So you know, they, there are uh, huge legal weaknesses and governance issues which add to the sense of vulnerability of the minorities in Pakistan and we need to swiftly move on that front. The context in which of course minorities are operating uh, has been partly explained by General Saab but that is not to deny the fact that you know, these are the groups uh, that, that require affirmative action, that require uh, forward leading policies by a heavily mandated government and they, they need to get a sense of getting mainstreamed. Uh, that, that's my take on it. Uh, on mainstreaming of hatred, frankly, I, I do not uh, subscribe to, to this terminology. There's no mainstreaming of hatred. There have been very unfortunate incidents uh, and the minority groups came out uh, and, uh, and protested violently uh, and that was their right. But I think what uh, most of us missed in terms of national reaction was the way the whole nation stood with them. So, uh, you know, if the nation were to simply ignore uh, these these uh, persecutions uh, of minorities, I would say that um, hatred has been mainstreamed. But I think there is no one in Pakistan who would uh, not have uh, shed a tear for those who, who get killed in these very unfortunate incidents. So, if anything, I think um, there's been mainstreaming of uh, the sentiment that we cannot let that happen. I think that's the, the, uh, that's the consensus here in Pakistan. Uh, okay, that was my bit of closing uh, remarks for the first session. How would you sum up the overall mood of where the Pakistan is today in the light of the new elections? And, and how do you see it moving on in the next five years, keeping the issues in Afghanistan in the background? I was very struck by the, the sobriety of the answers. I mean, people were positive, but not in, in a desperately over-optimistic way. And while on the one hand I suppose that was fairly depressing, uh, on the other I, I was pleased by it because I think part of the problem in the past in Pakistan, uh, whether with elections or actually with military coups as well, is that people have expected miraculous changes. Uh, and mirac miraculous changes just don't happen. Um, you know, the, the, the changes that are necessary will require long, steady work, work that will take a lot more than one period of Pakistani government or Pakistani parliament to achieve. Uh, the last government did achieve uh, some real things, especially when it came to the 18th Amendment, redistributing powers to the provinces, uh, the Finance Commission Award, redistributing taxation to the provinces. There were some real achievements there. Uh, but in, and, and, uh, in a number of other areas, for example, women's rights, uh, a lot of good legislation was put in place. But 
as we've seen, to actually implement that legislation will take a very long time. With the new government, the economic reforms that it is hoping to introduce will take a very long time. Uh, one of the speakers emphasised uh, the need to get Pakistan's fiscal house in order. Uh, that is absolutely central, but that is a challenge which every Pakistani government for the past 40 years has flunked. Uh, so we have to see how that will go. Without that, very little else can be achieved because, frankly, the state will simply lack the money to achieve anything else. The emergence of PTI into the, into the political scene of Pakistan and coming up as another viable opposition, how does that change the equation? Does it really will push the current incumbent government to deliver more within the next five years? We have to see. Um, the PTI, of course, did very well in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. It will now be judged above all on its performance in government in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Uh, whether just how much of a threat the PTI presents to the PMLN in Punjab is not entirely clear. They didn't do as well there as they hoped. Uh, on the other hand, the PPP has been very nearly eliminated in Punjab as a serious party. So if anyone is going to challenge the PMLN in their heartland in future, presumably it's the PTI or nobody. And the question would be just how scared of the PTI uh, is the, the, the PMLN administration, how far will the PTI galvanize them into taking action against corruption, for example, and, and patronage? Uh, because there is, of course, a risk that the scale of the PMLN victory will make them complacent. Uh, they'll feel, in fact, that they don't need to pay much attention to the opposition, perhaps outside Karachi and Sindh, where the PMLN has no role at all and therefore will have to allow others to, to, to govern. Uh, and that could be rather dangerous because, as came out in some of the questioning, although it's not at all clear as the panel brought out just how dangerous this is, um, Pakistani politics is more provincialized than ever before. That's not the same thing as ethnicity or nationalism, because of course all the provinces in all the provinces ethnicity you know cuts in different ways. But certainly I think it would be a danger for the PMLN to think that just because it won, it won a, an overwhelming victory in Punjab and therefore numerically as a result a strong victory nationally that uh, therefore you know they, they are secure. Um, the lack of a PMLN presence in any kind of presence in Sindh and Karachi uh, could be a very major threat in future because they will have no grip on what happens there. And that will mean that they will have to govern in accordance with the PPP and the MQM. The overriding sentiment in Pakistan, if you take this discussion slightly toward the Afghanistan, the overriding impression in the military circles and in the political circles in Pakistan is that the moment the, the ISF, the NATO and the America leaves the Afghanistan post-2014, the Pakistani problems will just evaporate in the thin air, everything will come back to normalcy, the, the insurgency will go away. Do you share that opinion or you do you think this is a beginning of something that may escalate even beyond that point? Well, I, I have to say that the military people in Pakistan I know are, are not so wildly optimistic. They think that the Western withdrawal could I improve the situation, but their fears as to what happens. I mean, help to explain why Pakistan, and as we heard, by the way, at, at this meeting, particularly the Pakistani military, uh, have supported so strongly the latest American uh, attempt at peace talks with the Taliban, precisely because they're afraid of what will happen otherwise uh, after America leaves. Because, of course, one possibility is that the Afghan Taliban go home, the war in Afghanistan dies down, a good deal of the motivation for people joining the Pakistani Taliban goes away, and yes, Pakistan benefits. But of course, there are much darker scenarios. Um, one is that uh, the war in Afghanistan continues, um, that there is no peace settlement, uh, that the forces opposing the Taliban 
more and more invite India in to help them, which is of course Pakistan's nightmare, um, that a new wave of refugees is created from Afghanistan's Pashtun areas uh, into Pakistan, which further radicalizes the situation uh, inside Pakistan. And actually that, you know, things get much worse for Pakistan as a result. So, um, well, that, that, that is why, and, and I've very much tried to myself to draw the attention of people in the West to this, Pakistan has been so supportive of the present peace process. Uh, that doesn't, of course, mean that it will necessarily work, but the fact that Pakistan, and specifically the Pakistani military, are solidly behind the present American efforts is very important, I think. Your last question to the panel was that if they had a magic wand in Pakistan, what would they do? How would they, what would they suggest as a final one-line answer? If I may ask this question to you, being almost a Pakistani, <laughs> uh, if you had a magic wand, what would you do in terms of Pakistan and its problems? I'd make people pay taxes. Single most important thing by far. Um, it, Pakistan raises the lowest proportion of its GDP in taxes of any country in South Asia. And South Asian rates, of course, are very low by international standards. Um, if, if Pakistan could only bring its, its tax collection levels, even up to the level of Sri Lanka, let alone the level of India, uh, which is 40% higher, uh, it, it would have so much more money to spend on all the things we heard about today. Um, education, uh, creation of infrastructure, all the things the country needs to do to progress, but, but can't if there is simply no money to, to, to do these things. But uh, unfortunately, to do that quickly would require a magic wand because, of course, levels of tax evasion and tax avoidance in Pakistan are you know, absolutely monstrous. And I'm sorry to say, of course, as we've seen over the past year, are led by the political classes themselves, you know, notoriously led by um, members of parliament, members of the provincial assembly, ministers. So this is not going to be easy to change. But without changing it, um, you know, the, both the inability of the, the ability of the state to provide services will be critically affected. But also, of course, Pakistan's macroeconomic situation will remain chronically weak because there will always be the budget deficit to cover. Pakistan will always be dependent on external inputs, uh, you know, to keep its state finances afloat. Uh, the rupee will always be in danger of, you know, radical inflation and so on and so forth. Um, so this is, because after all, the question of raising taxes is, historically speaking, the fundamental aspect of state strength or state weakness. If Pakistan cannot get that in order, it will never be a strong state. Another very pertinent point, if I may, may I mark it my last question. Of uh, another very pertinent, strong point that came out from the conference today was that there is a lot of political influence in decision making, and the government is always kind of for taking hostage to what group is is just taking the terms in there and where they get to draw their votes from. If we're ever brought down to the point of raising taxes or implementing taxes on the segments of society that at this point in time doesn't pay the tax, do you really think that this present government will have the wherewithal or the strength in order to be able to confront that political pressure on them? Because what you just suggested is absolutely vital for the Pakistan and the Pakistani economy. Do you think they will have the political will to be able to do this? Well, I don't know, but what I w would say is that given the strength of their mandate this time, you know, compared to any previous government, at least in many ways since, you know, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's success in, in 1970, uh, and given the fact that at the moment, uh, compared to previous periods, uh, there is very, very little military desire for intervention in, in government. I, I really do think there is a desire in the military to let the, the politicians get on with it. The military has enough on its plate fighting you know, the Pakistani militancy. Uh, if it's not possible now, it never will be possible for the foreseeable future for an elected government to do this. And that would, of course, be a tragedy for Pakistan's development. So I, I, I really think that the PMLN you know, does have an opportunity now and a duty in this field. And if it flunks it, uh, it will have flunked 
you know, the, 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 the biggest challenge of, of, of Pakistan for the decades to come. We do very much pray that this note has been taken down in the Pakistani parliament. Thank you very much for your time. A pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.